the ability to cover news dispassionately, and you hear so much about fake news and biased news and bad news, and et cetera, et cetera. And I'm here to tell you that there's a lot of people in the press corps in both countries who work very hard every day to take their prism glasses off, write the article, and then put the prism glasses back on when you talk politics with your you know, partner. That said, yeah. It makes me a really boring person to have Friday night dinner with, if you're not my partner. But that said, it's an important issue and you cannot cover this issue on either side of the ocean without understanding that the Israeli government, perhaps up until this year, didn't get how big an issue it is for people here. They have other things on their mind, but I really don't think that for years and years and years, they understood how big of a wedge issue this is, perhaps bigger in some ways than say Iran deal, no Iran deal, BB speech to Congress, not BB speech to Congress. This is a very big wedge issue because it's not just saying Israel wants X and the American public wants Y, it's basically saying Israel doesn't understand the degree to which this is important to so much of the American Jewish public. And so I think that what's happened particularly in the past 18 months is that the American Jewish public has been working very hard on being vocal about, not just about this issue, but on about how important this issue is to so very many people. And I think that that's kind of the critical point in the balance here. I don't have a quite a, as personal a story as Rebecca's, um, but I've been I've been watching this for a year and a half. Um, I've worked for four Jewish members of Congress in my time on the Hill, and um, the members of Congress that I've worked for are very pro-Israel. Um, they have made it their life's mission to be pro-Israel uh, in Congress, and I have never seen them as critical as they were on this issue. It's not always public, um, but um, three, four Jewish members of Congress have come out and said that, um, that the cabinet should withdraw um, their decision. Um, and there were members of the Jewish community that called them kapos. And this speaks to what Rebecca was talking about, that we are, we are focusing on the issues that divide us rather than the issues that unite us. But this is an issue where more and more Jews are finding consensus on. And um, it's, this is not about withholding contributions or withholding travel. I've seen those kind of threats. This is a dialogue between Israel and the diaspora, the diaspora and Israel. Um, and, and a recognition that we are important. Um, the, I witnessed a meeting last week um, with with a, uh, a representative of the Israeli government um, and various members of Congress. And I'll tell you two comments. One member of Congress said, you're, st you're sticking us at the back of the bus. You might be prettying the back of the bus, but it's still the back of the bus. And I think that that started to make them understand a little bit, send it back to Jerusalem a little bit. The other comment that I'll share with you is um, another member of Congress said, um, you know, the, it, it's, it, if France had said reform Jews are not allowed to choose who, get, who, who marries them, reform rabbis are not allowed to, uh, we, we will not recognize reform marriage. If France had said that, we would be up in arms. But because Israel's saying that, then that is, um, then that's okay. That's, but that's not acceptable to us. This is what the member of Congress said. And the Israeli government representative said, oh, you know, there's always been an issue with civil marriage and civil marriage. And the member of Congress said, I'm not talking about civil marriage. I'm talking about religious marriage, my religion, reform Judaism. And I think, again, this is a message that, um, is, is starting to be sent to Jerusalem that, um, that the American Jewish diaspora is waking up um, and that we want, to be, um, we want to be counted. Now, there are some things that American Jews are just not going to weigh in on or should not weigh in on, and a lot of that has to do with Israeli security decisions. But on this issue, 
that is very deeply personal to a lot of American Jews because it's telling us where we can pray <coughs> and who's going to recognize our marriage. Um, this is where American Jews do have a voice. I'm not going to tell another story. I'm just going to weigh in that from the Israeli political side, I think one thing that's very important to take into consideration here is that for the vast majority of Israeli political parties, this is simply not an issue with which they want to engage. That the engagement on issues of religious pluralism in Israel, or specifically in opposition to issues of pluralism in Israel, is the ballywick of a small group of parties who are brought into power by the nature of the coalition government. And so, for instance, Netanyahu, depending on his coalition partner, can take different stances regarding the state of religious pluralism in Israel, as will pretty much any other government. And so when we're looking at this in terms of the capacity to talk to Israel about this conversation, number one, yes, it's a conversation because it's about Jewish religious freedom and kind of the nature of the world Jewish community. But it's also a conversation to have with the government because the government's own position is open to negotiation depending on what the government perceives to be the most advantageous of the two voices that actually care about it, which is not the majority of the Israeli people. Though I think if you look at the polls recently, Hadush came out with a poll and they looked at how people in Israel, not in the United States, but what people in Israel thought about the decision. And it was over, it was between, I forget now exactly the numbers, between 74 and 78 percent of Israelis thought that the cabinet decision was wrong and that they should reverse it, that they should not take the decision they had. So I think, <clears throat> I think we're seeing some change in Israel itself as well as in the diaspora. And, um, and part of that is there is a new citizen watchdog group that's operated by the Mizorti movement in Israel called Jewish Pluralism Watch, where they actually <coughs> are watching. It's the first time there's a citizen watchdog group in Israel, and they're watching what the members of the Knesset are doing. They're reporting on it. They're sharing it with the Israeli public so that people can use that in their decision making as they go to the polls, as they help put together the party slates. And Knesset members are starting to understand that people are watching them and paying attention to these issues of pluralism. So I think some of this is changing. But that gets us back, I think, to the question we started off with at the beginning. Can Israel continue to claim, as as the Prime Minister continues to do regularly, that Israel is the nation state for the Jewish people while they have policies that undermine the rights of the diaspora Jews as well as Jews living in the state of Israel. No one wants to touch that one. <laughs> So let me ask you, let's have a show of hands. How many of you think that Israel can continue to claim to be the state for all Jews if they have policies that do not represent all Jews? How many of you think Israel can continue to make that claim? Okay, not too many of you. Okay, so I think this is a message that we're trying to bring back, right, to the, to the Israeli government and Women's League along with all the other grassroots <laughs> Jewish organizations, both in the reform and the conservative movements, actually met at the embassy last Tuesday and presented a very strong statement about how they felt that the current decision undermined the relationship between us in the diaspora and those in Israel. What impact in Congress do you think these kinds of show, the signs of disrespect have um, to the majority of worldwide jury has on the policies and attitudes of the Congress people who partly support Israel because not only their own personal convictions, but because they get lobbied a lot by Jews and people who care about Jews. Do you think this is, do you believe as some authors do like David Makovsky and Dov Zachheim, both Orthodox Jews, who believe that Israel is actually undermining its security by alienating diaspora Jews. Do you think this is going to have an impact on our members of Congress? This will have as big of an impact as you make it. Um, if you 
If you go to your member of Congress or their staff and you say, I am a strong supporter of Israel, I, um, I believe in Israel's security, and I want you to communicate to, um, to your interlocutors in Israel that this matters to my constituents. Um, they, can pass, they can surely pass that message along. And you can also contact your consul general. Um, you can contact your, the, the representative of Israel in your community and, um, and, and ask for a meeting and make your case um, so that they're also communicating it back to Jerusalem. This is for sure, for me, a, a more difficult question to answer, uh, particularly as I'm not Jewish. Uh, so it's not as, as personal an issue for me, and it's an issue that I'm more recently becoming aware. Um, I would agree with Rebecca that uh, I don't think this has been an issue for Israel, largely because 5% of Israelis identify as either reform or conservative. Uh, and so when you have such a small percentage of the population who identify as such, it's not, it's not a, a topic of conversation per se on the street. So when you have polls like this that bring the awareness to the Israelis, that is an important concept. When other things along these lines are brought to the attention of Israelis themselves, I think that is, that is important. But at the end of the day, Netanyahu has to maintain his government. He has to maintain unity among the Jewish people because of that within Israel. Because if that falls apart, they won't protect their borders. If they can't protect their borders, you won't have a state of Israel. So it won't matter whether or not Israel is simply a state for Israel or a state for the Jewish people. I think it's up to you as to whether you want to protect that. So I think it's really funny, yes, there's a very small fraction of Israelis identified as reformer Masorti, and there's a larger, but still definitely not even a plurality of Israelis who identify as ultra-Orthodox. One thing to point out is that there's also quite a growing number of Orthodox Israelis who identify with pluralistic Orthodox movements in Israel, but the vast plurality of Israelis aren't anything. But what I always pointed out, wait, 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 what I always pointed out to people in Israel is that a lot of Israelis to me look like conservative and reform Jews because they get together and they have Friday night dinners and their kids know to say the brachot at the beginning of Friday night dinner and they have a Seder and maybe their Jewish education isn't as hot as like my super Jewish day school education, shout out to my high school teacher here. But when it comes down to it, if you are asking what is the role of the voice of Jewish Americans who aren't Haredi, Part of it is in saying to Israelis, we also have an example of a way for you to be Jewish and Israeli. And we can offer you a little bit of that. I was on a tour once of Israeli parliamentary aides to America to see the American Jewish community. And it was fascinating because they couldn't figure out how to label the students at the Jewish day school where my children go to school. There's mothers with wigs, there's mothers with sports bras. They all drive Honda Odysseys. But in, but in Israel, they don't have a model for what you are if you're not part of the rabbinate's category of orthodoxy. And the only other word they have is chiloni, which means, we'll call it secular, you can call it profane, but it doesn't reflect the reality of Jewish practice in Israel. And so maybe that's something. We're talking a lot about going this way. One thing that can come this way is expressing these other forms of Jewish practice as viable options to the Israeli public to reflect what they already, al they already do, basically.
One of the things I think that some of that's been happening already, and one of the things that's really interesting is when you look at the rabbis who are Reform and Mazorti rabbis in Israel, many of them have served on Shlichut, they've been ambassadors to the United States, and they've been inspired to find new ways to be Jewish and to go back. So you've been already having an impact on there. The other thing I'll say is the census data, the government takes data on where people go daven for the holidays. They do surveys. And last year at the High Holidays, 22% of Jews who went to High Holiday services went to a Masorti congregation. So the numbers are changing. We're going to change things up. You've been a fabulous audience, and now you're going to get a chance to ask some questions. And I, as moderator, get to channel Phil Donahue, who I grew up with. And I'm going to come down and let you ask your questions. So I want you to raise your hand if you've got a question, and I'm going to come around to you. So we'll start on this side over here. Hi, I, I have found this extremely informative with a daughter who made Aliyah over 25 years ago, and two uh, grandchildren serving in the IDF right now. I do want to, I, the, my daughter deserves that, not me. <laughs> Um, I just want to remark that Rabbi David Galinkin of the Schechter Institute told us on Monday that you are right, it is changing in Israel. He gets many calls from people who want to have a bar or bat mitzvah in a Masorti congregation, want to observe that way. Things are really changing. Thank you. Anyone else on this side have a question? Oh, right next to her. How great is that? I have always been a believer in the two-state solution, and I have, I have changed. I'm now a believer in a one-state solution, because for how long can a people tell a country with whom they supposedly want to have an agreement that they wish they were dead and all in the sea? There's been no change for how many years? 70 years. And I think that there comes an end to all dialogue. I also believe that the Palestinians who live in Israel actually have a better life than the Palestinians who live in so-called Palestine. So I have changed my mind on behalf of everybody in the region, and I believe that it would be better now to fight for a one-party, sta one-state solution. Thank you. So, so, what do you think, Hara, Mira? Are there is there any undercurrent in Congress of people who want to turn away from a two-state solution? Right. I'm not sure that there's a, uh, as you mentioned, an undercurrent to turn from a one-state solution. I, I would agree there is increasing frustration over the fact that every single time we make an effort for peace, it doesn't go well for Israel. Uh, I mean, even including the Oslo Accords, you know, Israel implements the vast majority of the requirements. Palestinians essentially accept the weapons and training for their police force and do nothing else, including, frankly, change their name. I mean, all of their legal documents still say PLO. We refer to them as the Palestinian Authority. The world refers to them outside of the Islamic communities as the Palestinian Authority, but they didn't even change their name on their legal documents, nor their charter, nor their teachings within the school system, um, nor their continually uplifting of terrorists as their form of celebrity. Um, so I think that frustration is very real, and I think there are a number of members, uh, and I'm, I would assume that there are some on the Democrat side as well, who, who wonder how we ever truly get to a two-state solution if we can't find that partner for peace. Mira, do you have anything you want to add to that? No? Okay. There's a question here. Okay. Um, I have a short, a very short personal story and, and then a question. And that is that my great niece was adopted from Taiwan, um, was converted, 
and um, now I am very worried about her. She's 17 years old, going on 18, and I'm worried about what will happen to her should the family return to Israel and she want to be married. Do you, do you have a question as well? That was, so, so, uh, so the state of the conversion bill is that it's actually been put on hold for six months, but that doesn't mean that it's not gonna come up later. But do you have any other news about the conversion bill? Anyone else? I think they just don't want us to pay attention. So they're hoping we're going to forget. And it's up to us to remind them that we're not forgetting and that we're keeping our eyes on the ball. OK, I just want to um, comment on uh, the one-state solution or two-state solution. Uh, at this point, I don't have, I don't have uh, a choice for either one of them. I don't know because things are evolving. But personally, this is what I thought. If Israel will draw a green line where the West Bank is and have two options, either ask the settlers on that side to move back and then Israel will monitor that, give them their Palestinian identity, let them run a government, build up the West Bank, or whatever they want to do, and Israel, just for security reason, will be there. That's one option. Or you can give the settlers, and I don't want to offend anybody, the choice. This is going to be a Palestinian government. It's your choice. Either stay there, be part of the Palestinian government, or come back on the other side and be on the Israeli government. So that's one, one thing. The other thing is in the uh, whole discussions from the American government, but also the Israeli government, when Israel comes to a point where it will have to compensate or, or uh, return land to the original Palestinians in 1948, uh, do you know that there is also the issue of the Jews from the Arab lands? 185,000 have been kicked out of their lands, taken away their full citizenship, uh, froze all their assets. Very established Jews there. And I just wanted to know if, whether this is on the table or even whether, uh, I don't know, where our Americans will know about this. American Jews, obviously. Thank you. Thanks for your question. You. Um, this is something that um, came up during the last round of negotiations under the Obama administration quite a bit, uh, because the, uh, both the American negotiators and the Israeli negotiators pushed on this particular issue. Um, it's one of the most interesting parts of, um, of sort of a, this outside-in approach that um, that you that not only would Israel be getting peace with the Palestinians, but it would also be getting peace with with its Arab neighbors. That the Arab countries have a have a have a, a stake here as well, and they will be able to contribute toward the um, toward the um, the money or whatever goes toward Arab Arab uh, Arab Jews. But I'll tell you a story. Um, I was sitting in a meeting with the Lebanese foreign minister a few weeks ago, and um, he was uh, he was telling the congressman that I work for, you know, the 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 Israelis and the Palestinian issue. The Palestinian issue won't go away. And the congressman that I work for looked at him and said, you know, it's it, you guys are contributing to that. You, you guys are, are the ones who are perpetuating the Palestinian issue. They're living in refugee camps since 1948. I mean, what, what, what did you think was gonna happen? Um, and he goes, just keep in mind what Israel did with, with Arab refugees. They welcomed them, they, they, they made them part of the country. Um, and the Lebanese foreign minister looked at him and goes, Arab refugees? There were no Arab refugees. And the congressman looked at him and said, that's, that's just, not the case, and he started ticking off countries. And the best part about the meeting was that we gave the Lebanese foreign minister a little lesson, but also his former ambassador, the former ambassador to the United States, started ticking off additional countries, Morocco, Yemen. He knew, 
And he, uh, and he also gave the Lebanese foreign minister a little lesson. <laughs> Do you have any questions over here? Whoa, okay. Let's, let's pass the, uh, let me just, let me just, do, do, do. I'm gonna climb in. Okay. Excuse me, excuse me. I love it. Hi, uh, I also have grandchildren and big family in Israel and children that served in the IDF, but that's not my question. Uh, the question is the relationship between um, Israel, the United States, and the, and the United Nations and what can be done to improve that situation. I personally think the only, or one of the good things that the Trump administration did is, is to appoint Mickey Haley, uh, who I think is great. Rebecca, maybe you also want to comment about UNESCO, which is part of the United Nations, and their contribution to the discussion. Oh boy. Well, I think you've kind of hit a very interesting nail on the head, which is, in general, the larger question about the internationalization of all things Israel-related, right? Israel sneezes, and it's an international scandal. Whether or not it's issues that are internal. So for instance, on anti-Israel websites, I've seen many of the issues that we think of as Jewish world issues coming up as justification for anti-Israel perspectives as well. The situation with UNESCO, which is not to say don't have the discussion, God forbid, um, but the issue with UNESCO, the situation with UNESCO is a very interesting one. I think it was instructive for Israel because what ended up happening two UNESCO resolutions ago was that the United States, together with some allies, brought to the attention of many member countries that when you see a resolution that attempts to deny Israeli sovereignty or even Jewish relevance to a historical site. It not just threatens the Jewish ability, the Jewish capacity to access that site, but also the Christian capacity or even the secular tourist capacity to access that site. And so I think that actually under Ambassador Haley, what we've seen is this kind of creative outreach going on to look for alliances for Israel within the United Nations that have sought to say, look, this isn't just an anti-Israel resolution. Let's look at the bigger picture. Let's look at what this means. And we've seen that repeatedly with the internationalization of anti-Israel politics. We saw it also when it came to the um, International Court of Justice. We saw the United States helping other states understand how what appears to be just one of these token anti-Israel actions actually has serious implications for many members of the community of nations. And so we see a pattern moving forward for proactive action and coalition building, as dismal as UNESCO might seem. Interestingly enough, uh, the UN today brought up the issue of the um, security issues. Uh, on the Temple Mount, thank you. Uh, meanwhile, we've had three different massive bombings around the world, and they're not, they're not raising that as an issue at all. <coughs> a few years back, uh, Dory Gold, former ambassador from Israel to the UN, wrote a book entitled Tower of Babel. It's a fascinating book, and I highly recommend it, but it is uh, entirely on the UN. And in it, he makes the case that the UN has lost its moral compass that when they are comparing the perpetrator to the victim and putting them on the equal platform, there is no longer that moral compass. When you allow dictatorships to have membership into an organization that was founded in order to protect those that were without a voice, we have a problem. When you ha allow massive human rights abusers to take seats on the Human, human Rights Council, and not only take seats, but potentially take leadership roles, you have a problem. So I think there, at some point, has to be a serious discussion about whether or not the UN has lost, again, that moral compass, the, the right to have that moral voice. My boss, in particular, would say they absolutely have, and he doesn't really have a whole lot of use for the UN anymore. There are certainly some programs that are valid and good, 
but when they allow genocides to occur under their watch, when you have, you know, and, and just to kind of add to that story, you know, I've, I've seen the video of UN uh, entities that were operating in the UNIFIL um, area on the border between Israel and Lebanon laughing when Hezbollah not only went into Israel, but also captured several Israeli soldiers several years ago, and then ultimately killed them. And it took us five years of negotiations to find out that they were dead within the week. There's video of them laughing about how Hezbollah is doing this. And they are utilizing UN vehicles in order to transport and rearm Hezbollah all the time. That is a problem. So what are we going to do about it? And um, there are two options, as far as I can see. We can try to make it better, or we can withdraw. And um, those are pretty stark choices. Um, but I would argue that we absolutely see the structural failures of the UN itself. Um, but is the UN anti-Israel or are its members anti-Israel? And that's something that, that we need to consider. Um, the, the Jacob Blaustein Institute, um, and uh, apologies for me you know, touting another Jewish organization at a Jewish organization's event, but the American Jewish Committee's Jewish, Jacob Blaustein Institute came out with a, um, with a study about what the UN Human Rights Council looked like before the US was a member and after, and the words they used was game changer. That US leadership on the UN Human Rights Council was a game changer. It allowed the number of anti-Israel resolutions to go down, while the number of resolutions that spotlighted other atrocities in the world, whether it's the genocide in Syria uh, against, uh, Syria and Iraq against Christians, or, um, or Assad's um, murder of his own people, or um, the, global LGBTQ issues, um, this, is, this is what the UN Human Rights Council began to look at because of US leadership. And to walk away from that would be, um, would be a serious mistake. Now, there are ways that the US should and could be looking at the UN Human Rights Council, whether it's criteria for membership or lobbying for certain people to, um, to, to, uh, to get on the, on, the, um, on the committee, but the... Um, we don't have to walk away from that, is what I'm saying. So we have only two more minutes. We have two very quick questions. <laughs> Thank you for the token mail in the room to ask a question. I appreciate it. Um, on the pluralistic uh, question that we've been talking about, quick introduction. My wife and I were at a meeting with uh, President Rivlin two years ago as a part of the United Synagogue Board of Directors mission to Israel. And that's where he famously said, we're all brothers. My apologies to everyone here, sisters included. But um, in, in the history of Israel um, and um, parts of the government trying to uh, maintain their relevance, we've seen Israel be very concerned that when they adopted the Arab territories that the population percentage that was Jewish was going down. In the case of the uh, conversion uh, bill and the uh, uh, Robinson's Arch area, is this a, also the case where those who are in control of the government are afraid of losing their relevance being that the Orthodox portion is less than half of the observant population or total population in Israel, that it's a case where they're more afraid of the result, where actually the result of working together with brothers and sisters would actually be a much stronger Israel and more relevance in the eyes of the rest of the world. Let's ask, let's ask the last question and see if you can combine them. Uh, to tell you the truth, I was going to ask about the Israeli political system, and then I decided that we really cannot solve that problem. <laughs> so the question I really wanted to ask is what we can do here in North America, because we find that there is an awful lot of attacks on Israel on every side that you can think of, both from the right and the left. Now, this is something that has not happened for a long time, and I'm really disturbed about it. I, f I find that some of the things that I have been hearing, both on both sides, have been absolutely disgraceful in the way they speak about Israel. They, when they mention that they're having uh, metal detectors at the 
gate. They don't mention that three Israeli soldiers were killed up there because people carried guns to that site. And there's a lot of things between the pages that are not mentioned. So I'd just like you to discuss a little bit what can we do to level this playing field about the attacks on Israel. Thank you. Lisa wanted to make a comment. Are they going to answer that or not? Are you gonna, okay. Okay. I'm also going to make a political comment, but it's not what you think it's about. I want you all to look at this panel, okay? Um, when the program committee met, when the program committee met and we were going to talk about Israel, we all agreed we're celebrating 100 years of Women's League history. And I want you to know that 40, 50 years ago, when Women's League conventions talked about Israel, when the women spoke, and I'm not to denigrate these subjects, the women spoke about Jewish cooking, and they spoke about the arts in Israel, and they spoke about dancing, and they talked about raising their children. But the serious issues, the serious issues, the issues of politics, the issue of policy, was always the domain of men. And look